Hey guys, it's Ted Bogard. Welcome back to the Ted Show on this rainy and kind of gloomy Friday. But we're not going to be gloomy right now because I have the one and only Free Harris on the show with me. We're going to talk about it and I'm going to read it because I love how this is written. A series on identity, epigenetic coding, arts influences, and God and religion. Uh, very excited to have you on. I've been plan excited to hear your journey. That's what we all want to know. So welcome to the show, Free. How you doing? I'm doing great, Ted, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. I think so you've got a lot to talk about, so I want to take a deep dive. But before we do that, I was telling you that they love, the audience wants to know about you. They love an origin story. They kind of want to know a little bit about your journey. So can you share some 411 on that for us? Sure. Um, you know, uh, what's nice about it is, is that I had to learn who I was myself. And I suspect that's true of anyone um, who arrives from, um, there's a wonderful poem that uh, talks about arriving from the furthest reaches of the universe. And uh, then we land here on this planet. So uh, what I did was go and take a deep dive into how did I get here and what were the uh, cultural norms and influences in terms of theology and religion and politology and historiography and saying, what does that mean in 1962 in the United States of America uh, as a child? Um, at that time, it was called a Negro. So, you know, you don't have civil rights, you don't have some things, and you don't know that. When you arrive, you just are happy to be alive and with your parents and exploring the world as you grow. And then you come to find out that um, there are some very real barriers that are there and you don't know if you can or how to give voice to it. Certainly at three and five and seven, you don't understand what these things mean. But I'm a lot older now. Not old, just older. Uh -huh. You're so, not old. <laughs> You're a young so heart. You're I, young. Suspect, <laughs> I suspect just like everyone else, we're just trying to make meaning of what's going on. So my journey has been that in terms of understanding who I am in my family, in my community, what gifts am I bringing to the world? And then I'm um, going about the process of unmuting myself. Um, as a woman, and I suspect that a lot of people have these uh, identity crises, if you will, or trying to understand um, what does it mean to be a woman? You know, um, even men now, uh, I, I used to love the, um, the commercial, the worldwide sports, you know, the thrill yes. of victory, the agony of defeat. <laughs> well, uh, that announcer had a nervous breakdown very early in um, that particular series. And it was taboo to even talk about mental illness or mental wellness. And so who made these rules up? You know, who, who decided that you couldn't speak your truth? Yeah. So I, I would call these, um, from a religious standpoint, we would identify them as principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and wickedness that seek to bring us into a place of shame. I've learned over the years that, you know how people used to say, shame on you? And I used to, and I would always reply, shame off me, you know, shame off me. I, 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 have, I have a right that. to speak. Yeah, so when they say shame on you, when you say shame off me, there's a reason why um, Jesus died for my sins. He, he took all that off me. I now can speak Amen. my truth. And so um, that's been the journey of who I am. And I recognize that much of what history has taught me about myself um, in terms of not wanting to have a career. Well, I've been a banker pretty much my entire life and now I'm a developer. And uh, when I grew up, there were no leading people in the banking industry. And still today, I would say you'd have a better chance of finding a unicorn running in the wild than the scene of a woman at the head of a Fortune 500 company. And so we say, well, you know, who made these rules up? You know, because certainly we're great leaders and uh, we make up over 50% of the world's population and the United States population. So with these kind of numbers, you'd think we'd have a stronger voice. 
Is that and why yet you, we do uh, not. Is that why you tell them about? We had a bunch of people ask if your name is free. So talk a little bit about the journey of that, uh, because I love this. This I'll let you tell the story, but this is part of you developing and growing and challenging and feeling. Uh, talk about your name, free. Yeah, well, actually, it is a change name. So um, I figure that uh, when I decided to um, accept my true identity as who I was, um, uh, certainly my last name is indeed my last name. But um, as I evolved, the word free um, came into a very clear focus that I'm clear, to, I'm free to speak um, my truth. I'm free to show up openly and honestly and authentically and vulnerably to be able to allow people to see me as who I am, um, not the visual that you may uh, interpret me to be, but as a spirit that shows up in a fleshly existence, seeking to know others as we just sojourn this short period of time on earth. So yeah, um, it, you it changed it, it. When, you, changed. when you when you became when you decided free was it was it did it change your perspective and outlook immediately just by adopting that name uh, was it empowering was it you took your power back is that sort of the whole thought process behind uh, the word free as your name. Well, um, actually, it came um, as I was writing. It was part of the research and writing process. And so as I began to talk about things that were taboo, then I started recognizing that I'm free to say whatever I need to say. I'm free to openly share what is going on. And so when I kept identifying as I am, which is a very strong statement by itself. It emotes the uh, word of God, I am. And so when I got to I am, what was the next word that came was free. I'm free. And, and so it's scripturally based. It is exactly, it, it embodies who I am. So it was a journey. I mean, it took me six years of just research um, and it took me a lifetime of experiences to get to this point. So yeah, um, I am beautiful. everything I love it. that I, free is. I think it, it is, when I heard it, I thought, okay, that's not how I originally uh, knew you, but I loved the thought process of making that change. And then the change itself sort of adds to the manifestation, the law of attraction, uh, your soulful, spiritual, whatever your beliefs are, I feel like you put that out in the universe. And that is what the world, God, whatever you believe comes back to you. Uh, so I love it, by the way. Yeah. And I want to ask because I didn't look it up, but the very first part of your series on identity, the term that you use is epigenetic coding. Uh, and so we've already mm -hmm. had a bunch of people asking what that means. So uh, can you give us a little bit of the, the Cliff's Notes version of what, what is epigenetic coding and why is it important in your journey? Okay. Well, as it turns out, it's important to all of our journeys if we want to be real about it. So we have, we share the same DNA. As human beings, we share over 99% of the same DNA. So what makes us unique? Um, it happens to be our memories and the memories of our ancestors and what is actually going on in terms of experiences throughout our lives. And so our epigenetic coding happens to be, quite frankly, who we are at the cellular level based upon the experiences that we have had as well as those of our ancestors. And you may find that interesting, but you know, for those of you who are listening, uh, think about it this way. Uh, you may not have met an uncle or an aunt from you know, several generations ago, but somebody will tell you, you know, you walk just like that person or you have mannerisms just like that person. You may never have met the individual and yet your genetic coding, your epigenetic coding happens to be within you, that same ancestor, that same uncle, that same aunt. I don't know about you, but there have been times in which I've said a phrase or something that sounded so much like my mother, I almost wanted to turn around and think if she was in the room. <laughs> That's your epigenetic coding. Yes. So it happens to be something that um, you don't know what happened 100 years ago to your ancestors, but within, locked within your 
epigenetic coding, your DNA, are these experiences that you do have memory of, even if you can't verbalize them. So um, here's uh, two really great examples, the Maasai warrior and the lion. To this day, the lion is afraid of the Maasai warrior. His epigenetic coding remembers the Maasai killed them. They hunted, killed them. So just hearing the cowbell of the Maasai warrior causes the lion to flee. And, and, and there's other examples, rats who would have it and their children who would have a certain smell, even though they have never gone through the test, avoid the smell. That's their epigenetic coding. I so there's- I find it also fascinating. I've been reading, I didn't realize that's what it was called, but I have been reading a lot of research on this and how science is continuing to prove that it is all built in there. The memories of your ancestors are in there somewhere and it impacts you in ways that we are only now beginning to understand. But if you don't think what your ancestors did impacted how you are today, uh, it definitely did. And if you look at the negative side of it, but just to give a biblical example, the sins of the father, the, all of those conversations about uh, what went on in your past and how that impacts future generations, um, positive or negative, there is that memory, just like the lions remember the warrior, uh, that for them, that's a negative memory, but a good one so that they realize, hey, we're not gonna mess around with those people anymore. All right, right. we have questions that people wanna know free. What's the ultimate goal here? Are you, you talked a little bit about, about your book, but what are you trying to do? Are you, are you in a movement? Are you trying to engage people? Uh, do you want to consult with people? What are you trying to accomplish by, uh, expressing yourself and re-identifying yourself as free? Well, that's a, that's a great question, first of all, and thank you for asking that. But uh, the first thing I would like to say is, is that we can no longer stay in this state of division. Um, and so the goal is, is to begin a movement of unity, one in which we have to recognize that we are human first. And whatever we may think in terms of our epigenetic trauma and things that have happened in the past that maybe we can't even give voice to, or we don't wanna speak outside of those comfortable rooms, we must be willing to give voice to it and to begin the long journey back to loving not only one another, but most especially every aspect of who we are. So in, in talking about what it means to be who we are, I would ask the readers to go back and just discover what was going on when you arrived on this planet and why do you think you made the decisions that you made and what was going on at that time? You know, I arrived in Hamtramck, Michigan, which is a small Polish community. And my first school was called Kosciuszko. There are many things that I didn't know about my small town, but one of the things that was an indelible mark upon me that was quite painful is the fact that I grew up in a school that had uh, Catholic uh, influences and I'm left-handed. So anyone who understands that process, left-handed is not um, an acceptable characteristic. So for at least half the school year, I was not permitted to use my left hand and I would wow. frequently be hit hard on my left knuckle to the point where I had an open wound on it up until the time that I had to confess to my mother after failing penmanship that I, um, as my teacher said, had the sign of the devil. Now, if you're three and some teacher authority figure is beating you because you're left-handed and makes this statement, you're trying to make meaning of a world that you certainly could not prepare yourself for. Mm -hmm. But then as I continued to research things and began to understand what the influences were and why I made the choices that I made in my life, and even the moments in which I had low self-esteem and things like that, I began to recognize that these were not my characteristics. This is how the world greeted me, you know? So here I, I show up in school in 1965 and, and uh, that, you know, it's right after the civil rights movement and, and now kids can go to Head Start. And so I'm the only child that can do this. And this is what greets me. 
So I have to say that um, the journey of understanding the world that I've inherited, just like the world you've inherited and many others, we try to make meaning of it. And our parents, uh, God bless them, they try to do the best, but they are ill prepared to tell you about the great, 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 great grandfather that you had a hundred years ago. They weren't talking about that. Our parents were talking about survival, food, clothing, shelter, go to college, get a good job, you know, be a good person, whatever that means, you know, <laughs> being a good person that has a different connotation too, right? Amen. So um, the move, yeah. So the movement is really about um, how do how does humanity show up humane? How do we begin to go and heal our family's trauma? Most of us um, would have someone in our family that has done, in our opinion, an unforgivable act. It's unforgivable. Well, nothing's unforgivable. We cannot stay in that state. We have to begin this journey of reconciliation, this journey of love. And it starts with ourselves. We are really terrible at self-love. We, we think it's selfish. We think actually it's selfish to take a moment to just acknowledge who we are and that it's okay not to be okay. We're living through unprecedented times. And yet um, we would have, uh, we still have to keep up appearances. For what? I, I agree. I think what happens is that's the way I, I can't tell you how many people have uh, told this to me. And then we'll have we'll wrap it up because I, I would love to do a part two and part three of this or more. But I feel like people I, I hear people say, well, that's how I am or that's how my family is or that's how it's always been, because that's an easier path to go down than to question that maybe that wasn't the right thing. Uh, you do, and the people feel like they can't break the cycle because that will be disrespectful to their parents and ancestors. That will be disrespectful to their system. And then it messes them up and their foundation is all gone. And now they have to realize, oh my God, this wasn't perfect. Now what does that mean? Which leads us to, I want you guys to follow Free Harris. I want you to go to iwouldscream.com. I want you all to go to all the places that Free's about to tell us how you can reach her and learn, learn more about what she's doing. And you will definitely, we would love to have you come back free. So tell them uh, how the best way is to reach you. Okay, well, the best way to reach me is uh, free at iwouldscream.com. You can send me an email. And um, one of the things that I am currently teaching is about Nail Harper Lee. Um, most people don't talk about her, but she is a civil rights juggernaut. And I have come to love her and what she has done in a time in which uh, women simply didn't have a voice. And when they did, it was silenced. And then I turn around and I find out such amazing things about her. So I'm, I'm teaching a story about her and what it looks like and, and what she feels like contextually. And I just love her. And, and uh, Go Set a Watchman is one of my favorite stories about her. It was her first novel. And uh, so if you're interested in learning more about our history through film and through um, literary works, uh, just let me know and, and, you know, join me so that we can talk about, you know, this wonderful woman called Nail Harper Lee. All right. And I can and be reached. Another wonderful human, Free Harris. I want you all to reach out to her. Uh, Iwouldscream.com, free at Iwouldscream.com. I've tagged her in everything. We have lots of people who want to learn more. So please reach out to Free. Reach out to me if you can't get a hold of her. And yes, my, my fr friends, we will have free back on. Thank you for sharing your heart and your soul and your journey with us. Please, please come back. And I am so honored to have you on the show, Free. Thank you. Anytime. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right. Y'all reach out to Free. And if you can't